Um, I think it's a very important session because uh, in the past years, very few people um, talked about the public service media in the internet governance debates. Yeah, that's what I find. But also, I also find, find that we all share the same kind of problems. So you mean the public service media? Yes, you don't have to build a traditional or like-minded organization. It's not just in the media, but also in culture. Yeah, okay. and, uh, wir nehmen Sie mit auf eine Reise. Wir nehmen Sie mit auf eine Reise. Eine Reise durch eine digitale Kulturwelt. Unsere Zeiten sind schnell. Was wir sehen, was wir hören und was wir lesen. Orientierung bieten, neue Perspektiven schaffen. Film und Malerei. Musik und Literatur. Gaming und Design. Ein neues, emotionales Erlebnis. Sehen. Dokumentieren. 22 war ich. Denkst du, es hätte mich irgendein Arschloch gegrüßt? Debattieren. Du sagst, es trifft dich nicht. Nein, ich sag, es ist keine Beleidigung. Ja, ist doch wurscht, wie du es benennst. Beginnend mit 35 Kulturpartnerschaften in ganz Deutschland wird ein neuer Kulturraum erschaffen. Interaktive Reisen zu unbekannten Orten. Zielformen schaffen einen modernen Kulturbegriff. ZDF-Kultur heißt Entdecken, Genießen und Wiederkommen. Thank you for being here. Wir nehmen Sie mit auf eine Reise. Thank you for being here uh, to this session. Um, is a session on public service internet um, that uh, is as main goal to show where we are as public service broadcaster in Europe and um, quality media in uh, the reflection how to pr provide uh, to the viewers, to the listeners, to the uh, people that is on the internet a, a similar experience to what we provide in the broadcasting sector or in the quality printed media. So for this scope, we have here around the table three um, uh, No, you don't see all of them because some of them are remote. Uh, BBC, for instance, is connected and remote. And also, my colleague from EBU Geneva is in remote. But you see around the table here uh, representative of institutions that take care of guarantee the rights of the citizen when they experience the media, Council of Europe, WIPO, UNESCO. 
uh, on my right. And you see a colleague from ZF that you have seen the, the video clip now. And uh, you see uh, Gert from uh, the Netherlands broadcaster and Elena Perotti from the one, the association of um, uh, newspapers worldwide. So we are all here to discuss about this topic, uh, how we can ensure public service experience over the internet, and the, each one of us will give his own contribution. The first to open will be Jan Kleissen from the Council of Europe, because as you know, the Council of Europe is the standard setting institution for media in Europe. And so we, they are working a lot on how to define a new safe space of the internet experience for citizens. Thank you, Jan, the floor is yours. Uh, apologies from Jan that uh, he told me that he has to share the time with another session, so he will leave us after his presentation, but there is somebody in the room, Artemisa, uh, waiting, uh, will be with us in case there are questions for him. Thank you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Giacomo. Good morning, everyone. Yes, my apologies for having to leave you. It's just I was uh, booked, I was doubly booked, open booked, doubly booked for another session immediately after this. A few words perhaps about the Council of Europe, for those of us who don't know it. Uh, we're not the European Union. Uh, we're based in Strasbourg in France, but we're founded in 1949 uh, by people like Winston Churchill and Konrad Adenauer, basically to prevent the horrors from World War II forever repeating themselves. So that is our birth certificate, if you like. We celebrate 70 years. Thank you so much. We celebrate uh, our 70 years uh, birthday this year. Um, and uh, perhaps those of you who haven't heard of the Council of Europe have perhaps heard of the European Convention and the European Court of Human Rights, uh, which are part of our, of our setup and very important guarantees of, of course, the media freedom that Giacomo mentioned. Um, now I'll be very brief. Um, the internet was supposed to and could still provide us with uh, a very uh, varied, uh, with very varied information, uh, not only as regards quantity but also as regards quality, in theory. However, sadly, in most cases, it would seem that nowadays the internet, instead of increasing our choices, is limiting our choices, uh, because most people do not uh, navigate and really uh, navigate the open seas of the internet but stay in port, to use a nautical uh, analogy, don't get out of port, and just see the waves that are pushed against them. In other words, the information that is provided to them, rather than, uh, rather than going out there and, and, and explore. Uh, a well-known French writer has, has called this the goldfish culture. Uh, we'll all be like goldfish turning around in a little bowl, seeing what is there, what is put before us, uh, but we don't go out and look for it for us uh, it ourselves um, and for democratic societies in the long run this can be fatal uh, because a healthy democracy depends on a variety of opinion contrasting opinions uh, it it requires people to think uh, and to to make informed choices and I stress the word informed and uh, echo chambers filter bubbles or whatever terms or goldfish bowls if you like are not likely to, to promote that. So in the Council of Europe, what are we doing to try and, and, try and, uh, and resolve that? Uh, first, I would like to pay tribute to the various organizations sitting at this table, uh, including the IBU, uh, but also the national broadcasters uh, and the media outlets that are trying to counter this through investigative journalism to quality, uh, quality uh, productions. We just saw the ZDF uh, uh, example. Um, the various initiatives of the IBU uh, to ensure that quality journalism and uh, pluralist media remain, uh, remain strong. Um, since the Council of Europe is an intergovernmental organization, we have 47 member states and we cater for some 830 million people. We try to do that through standards, which Giacomo already referred to. Uh, we have uh, legal texts like the European Convention on Human Rights and we produce uh, standards in the form of soft law, recommendations to our governments, and we have a whole series of them uh, recently adopted, and I won't, won't list them to you, you can find them easily on the internet. And we have a very good booth here uh, with information material, booth number nine, just outside here, 
where you can find the different texts. Several, there were two already, adopt, for instance, adopted this year. Uh, but the aim is to encourage governments to uh, support quality media, to also support community media, because that is also very important in this whole uh, uh, globalized, the globalized uh, uh, goldfish bowl, if you like, that people are also aware what's hap what is happening in their immediate neighborhood and that they get reliable information, reliable information on that. So that is one track. Um, the second track, I already mentioned it, is the European Court of Human Rights, which enables individuals who feel that there has been an interference to, to complain. And what the court also does, some of these recommendations, or many of these recommendations I refer to, it uses them in uh, interpreting, for instance, uh, the right to freedom to information under the Convention on Human Rights, uh, which was drafted uh, some 70 years ago. Uh, and in order to interpret what it means to have the right to freedom of expression and freedom of information, the court frequently uses these policy texts. So via the back door, they come in as, uh, as, binding, as binding law. In addition to that, um, nowadays, uh, as we all know, a lot of internet content is moderated, not by humans, but by AI. And last week, we had in Strasbourg the first meeting of a rather unique committee uh, called Kahai, and it is unique because it's the first body in the world, the first instance in the world that has a mandate to negotiate a legal uh, framework for the use, for the design, development, and application of artificial intelligence. So going beyond the various ethical charters that we have, uh, and there are now some nearly 200 ethical charters and guidelines, many of them developed by industry, but also uh, in some like the Montreal Declaration that you may have heard of in a more uh, multi-stakeholder way, but they are not binding. And nowadays, the effects of artificial intelligence uh, and its impact is such that uh, at least 47 governments decided uh, to uh, give a mandate to a body to negotiate within a period of two years a legal framework for the use of AI. Uh, it will build on uh, a lot of these self, uh, self-regulatory instruments, uh, elements such as fairness, transparency, robustness, um, AI literacy. Uh, all these will certainly find their place, I think, also in the in the legal in the legal framework. Uh, and the negotiations are being carried out with uh, 47 states, European states, five observer states, including the United States, Canada, and Japan, Mexico. And, uh, but also with civil society, I'd like to stress that here at the IGF, with industry and with academia, um, as well as, of course, with other international organizations, which are, which are around the table. Uh, the first meeting was last week, uh, a very promising start, and we really hope within two years to be able to have this legal framework to ensure that um, as other technology that has a huge impact on us, uh, also digital technology meets certain standards uh, for the protection of the, uh, of the, uh, of the citizen. Uh, some people try to push this back and say that any form of regulation would stifle innovation. Pers personally, I think this is nonsense. Um, we happen to have at the Council of Europe uh, also a uh, regulatory body for medicine, um, the European Pharmacopoeia. Uh, it's called the Directorate for the Quality of Medicine, and it ensures that your, the aspirin you buy here in Berlin is the same aspirin you buy in Athens or in Oslo or in Reykjavik. Um, and medicine, um, uh, the production of medicine, is one of the most innovative sectors in industry, yet it is also one of the most regulated ones. So the fact that regulation as such would uh, stifle innovation, I think, does not, does not hold. Um, on the contrary, uh, good regulation, I think, will lead to, to much more quality, quality products. Uh, so that's where we are. Um, on, on both tracks, uh, we will have a, um, we'll discuss this also at the highest political level next year in May. There will be a ministerial conference in, in Nicosia, in Cyprus where we would very much, which will be attended by the ministers of the 47 Council of Europe member states responsible for media matters. Uh, we'll discuss the implications uh, of AI on the media landscape and public service media 
and its role on the internet. Uh, so very much the themes of this of this session. Uh, and we also intend uh, not only to have a formal setting where ministers speak to each other, but very much ensure that ministers will speak to civil society, to broadcasters, uh, to actors in the field, uh, so that they uh, that it will be an enriching experience and that they will take a number of decisions uh, to uh, further uh, make their governments aware and make governments aware that uh, broadcasters need support, the quality media need support in order to ensure that our societies remain healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, the difference in the past is that uh, in the far west, the, the train arrived after the, the sheriff and the justice were established. Here, the train is already there, and we, we still need the sheriff and the law arriving. Anyway, um, I hope that from Cyprus there will be some clear indication on that, and also the group on the artificial intelligence will have a section on media that will be quite important. I, I think that uh, is important for all of us to follow carefully what happens there. Um, now we try to do a sort of magic with a remote participation from our colleague from BBC. Uh, we tried before, we have some technical problems. I hope that now will work better. Uh, Bill, can you hear us and can, are you ready to take the floor? I can hear you and I'm ready to take the floor. Can you hear me? Perfectly, thank you. Um, firstly, I'm sorry not to be physically present, but I'm pleased that I can take part remotely. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm Bill Thompson. I'm a senior manager in the BBC's research and development uh, group, and we're the group of about 200 engineers, uh, developers, uh, user interface designers, social scientists and researchers who are imagining a future world in which the BBC could flourish and we hope in which all public service media could flourish. And our question today is how do we fix the internet? And I think the first thing is to acknowledge that the internet is actually broken. Uh, and many people have done that. We've, we've seen just recently Tim Berners-Lee, uh, the creator of the World Wide Web, talking about his contract for the web. And Jan Kleissen has just pointed out the dangers to a healthy society that are posed by the ways the internet is currently being used. And it was good to hear him talk about the ways the Council of Europe is trying to make things better online for all of us. The, the questions he raises are really important ones. And I hope that at the BBC we can play our part in addressing them. But once we admit the web is, the internet is broken, I think it's important to acknowledge that it can be fixed. And this is something many people despair about because they worry about human nature. Or crucially, they forget that we built this thing and so we can change it. We even have a model in the form of public service broadcasters about how we can shape media and technologies in the public interest. Because the BBC has been for nearly 100 years dedicated to delivering the best for people through the use of communications technologies. And now, in addition to broadcast media, we have IP-based media, and our ideas of what public service broadcasting is have grown to encompass the range of public service media that we talk about within the European Broadcasting Union. And the idea of media itself is extended to cover websites and apps and data services. So if we want to deliver public value online, as we're talking about here, we need an internet that can sustain those public services. Services that are shared, that are available to everyone so everyone can benefit from them. That are what we call legible, that can be controlled by their users. Services that are, that are not simply black boxes, disguised in legal terms and conditions and insulated from their users. And also services that appeal to a diverse group of people, that are there for all sorts of people, not just mainstream users. And that's part of our work within the BBC, where we're looking to develop the idea of the public service internet in terms of a broader context of what we call new forms of value that the BBC can bring to people. And in that context, we've identified four main pillars. The idea of public service networking, the ideas of publicly controlled data, to ensure that people are in control of and understand the data about them and how it's used. The idea of equal access for everyone, and the idea of a healthy digital public sphere, which can encompass all of these. And then crucially, we're looking at ways to measure the impact of this new way of operating. We're asking what an online space that can deliver public service outcomes looks like and how we can get there from here 
and how the net might have to change to support those public service outcomes. In some ways, this is very similar to the old question about what does radio transmission and sound and image look like when it supports public service, the, the driving question behind public service media in the first place. But when we began to develop broadcasting in the 1920s and then with television in the 1940s and 50s, these were new media. The internet already exists. We're moving into a space that has been shaped by commercial interests and shaped by political interests. And so it's not as easy to turn the network to our service. So we've been doing a load of projects around things like the interactions of people with data, how we express human values online in terms of the shape of our software, what our homes will be like when they are sensor rich and can monitor us and how we might control that, that monitoring in ways that benefit us. The use of personal data and personal data stores to insulate people from the large data monopolies and the social impact of all of these technologies. And it's crucial that we are able to measure the impact of the, of the um, innovations that we make and of the uh, changes we make, because otherwise it's probably not worth doing it. We can't demonstrate its value. And we're doing all of this work in the open and in collaboration with a range of organizations, including fellow EBU members, coalitions such as Public Spaces, who are on the panel, organizations in the UK such as Nesta, the Open Data Institute, and Dot Everyone. It's not something we would ever wish to do in isolation. The internet is a common treasury for all. The many services we can build on top of it provide a new way of engaging with audiences within which we can deliver our public service objectives and as we've heard from Jan Kleisen, appropriate regulation can support and sustain that innovation. So we look forward to working with other organizations to build a better internet for everyone to use. Thank you. Much, Bill. Very, very interesting. And to see that this is a network, is not uh, isolated experiences. Part of this network is here, so we will listen uh, exactly now. So I propose to, to change a little bit the order instead of having Antonio from Archidiacono from Geneva. If he doesn't, um, as an objection, I would give the floor to Gert, because Bill just mentioned the experience that is made in the Netherlands. That is a little bit different from what we, uh, the BBC is doing, but uh, it's interesting because it's open to civil society. So it's a way to install a dialogue, a permanent dialogue between civil society and broadcasters. Can you tell us more about that? Sure, absolutely. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Let's see if my presentation works. There it is. That's great. So uh, I, don't, I don't have to talk a great deal about all the problems that, that you know, we, we face nowadays with the internet. Uh, there are act uh, actually 99 problems only with, with the use of Facebook alone associated with it. Um, and uh, we all know about it and we all struggle through it. But I believe with Bill and with the BBC that actually there is uh, a solution problem uh, uh, possible. Uh, we can work together as we've uh, tried to do in the Netherlands over the last year and a half, uh, actually by building a coalition of like-minded parties that are not just broadcasters, but also organizations uh, within uh, the sphere of cultural heritage, cultural institutions, festivals, uh, within education, within healthcare, all organizations that share more or less the same dilemma. They are, uh, on the one hand, forced to use big commercial platforms like Facebook and YouTube in order to get their message across to the, to the public, to their audiences. They even have, in, very, in many cases, a legal obligation uh, to uh, reach as many people as possible, while at the same time, um, the use of those platforms run con runs uh, con um, contrary to uh, their own mission statements. So as at VPRO, we make, uh, I'm, I'm representative of a public broadcaster, we make a lot of programs in which we kind of criticize uh, how Facebook is using its data, but at the same time, we we're using Facebook to promote those programs. So there's really something um, wrong there. Our dilemma, uh, we try to solve it by estab establishing a new set of public values that we feel any kind of internet service provider or uh, internet platform should try to adhere to. And we commit ourselves within the coalition um, to uh, adopting 
and building alternative implementations, software implementations, uh, to actually provide alternatives to the public for the YouTubes, for the Facebooks, for the search engines, and so on. And we're doing that not only within the coalition, but also uh, on the broader range within Europe. As Bill mentioned, we're working with the BBC, but there's also some contacts with ORF from, uh, from Austria, with, from uh, Wiley E from Finland. Uh, we've been talking to ZDF, who is also present on the, on the panel here. So it's a very interesting thing to notice that uh, actually in most of the European countries, there are coalitions or initiatives like ours underway. Um, we're developing along three tracks. We're trying to raise awareness, not only among the general public, but also within our own ranks, because even within our organizations, not, not too many people still feel or uh, uh, share uh, the insight that there actually is a big problem, but also awareness within policy, uh, within civil service, and so on. Uh, furthermore, our second track consists of adaptation, adaptation and adoption of alternative solutions. There are lots of open source solutions out there. For instance, uh, there's an alternative to YouTube, which is called Peertube, uh, which is uh, uh, a crime to use. It's very difficult. It's not very user friendly. So what, we, what our unique selling point obviously is we reach in the Netherlands alone 10 million people. We've got lots of experience in, in user interface design and user experience design. So we can actually improve on those solutions and uh, give them back to the open source community while at the same time adopting and adapting them and presenting them to the audience. Uh, and the third track is the development of so-called what we call badges. They are kind of like a public representation of the, of the, uh, of the main values that are uh, present in our manifesto. Um, and, um, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about those badges a little bit later on, but for the moment what's important is that what we're trying to do is we we, we um, uh, identify the solutions that are most urgent to implement from our perspective, from the organizations within the coalition, but also from the audiences and the public's perspective. Uh, we map them out and we try to identify what solutions are actually most um, uh, coherent with our, uh, with our uh, values. So some examples, we're looking at ISO, which is a, a, an alternative commenting tool. We're looking at Peertube, we're looking at Mastodon, which is an alternative tool for, uh, for uh, social communities. Um, and we're looking at authorization, authentication uh, uh, solutions, uh, so that you don't have to rely on Facebook or Google to log in into whatever application or website that you want, but that actually the data that you provide are safe within your own vault, if you will. Um, once uh, we start using those alternatives, uh, organizations that promote them can uh, apply for badges. And badges are um, uh, technical uh, representations, but also visual representations and technical implementations of those values. For instance, uh, at VPRO, this is an example of what a badge of public spaces would look like. This is in the footer, you imagine, of a website. Um, uh, you can click on it, on the public spaces badge, and then uh, it will uh, open up and it will tell the audience uh, to what extent VPRO, my own organization, where this is going to be implement implemented now, is already adhering to those, uh, those public values. And you can imagine that the more uh, alternative solutions we manage to implement, uh, the greener, so to speak, our badge becomes. Um, this is obviously skinnable, so you can uh, um, uh, you know, apply it and use it within your own environment. So in this way, we think we can actually provide uh, alternative solutions, but also make public more aware of the existence of those solutions, while at the same time trying to um, uh, establish some kind of brand of trust, if you will, uh, where people can actually validate that we are uh, uh, not only uh, you know, saying those things, that we adhere to those values, but that people can also control that we, that we do that. Um, well, you can find us online, obviously, and uh, I hope um, you can, you'll be able to find us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gert. Um, just one question. These badges you provide only for people that are part of the community, or you can provide also to third parties <laughs> it's to guarantee? To be because it's interesting, the concept that you validate if somebody is healthy, doing healthy internet or not. It's going to be an open batch, so it's going to be an open process that you can apply for online. Um, and there's a system of unit tests going to be in place, and those unit tests will actually 
manage uh, the validation, the technical validation. Uh, so, you know, you can imagine uh, the complexity of trying to translate uh, a value like transparency or privacy into something that's technically uh, feasibly uh, uh, validable, uh, if you will. You, you told me that you also are thinking to apply this to parties, political parties. Um, well, I, I th at the moment, we are not excluding anything or anybody. I mean, uh, as long as parties adhere to our public values, why not? Um, uh, so in the end, even Facebook, for instance, will be able to apply for it. Uh, they're going to have a hard time trying to comply <laughs> with all our values. But if they do, well, why not? <laughs> okay, I will tell Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, uh, now the, there is um, another component of this debate uh, is uh, the technicalities. Uh, we need, in order to develop this public sphere safe for citizens, we need also technical tools. Uh, in Geneva at the EBU, the European Broadcasting Union, uh, we have um, a department that is called Technology and Innovation. The director is with us uh, on remote, is Antonio Arcidiacono, and they are developing a certain number of tools with the members uh, that mm, will make easier to have an, an healthier internet. Antonio, uh, we tried the magic again uh, with you. Let's see if it works. Antonio, can you hear us? It's only once. Uh, so, waiting to, to have Antonio with us um, to reestablish the contact, then we can go to the next, to the next part. Um, Elena Perotti from One IFRA, that is the Association of Newspapers. We made this open because the quality of the internet and the public service is not a prerogative only of public service broadcasters, but also quality media are part of this um, uh, future environment in which we hope that we will all live. So sure. I leave the second part of the moderation to Elena, and I try to recover where Antonio. Ah, Antonio. Antonio, can you hear us? I do. I do. Hello. Yes. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay, I assume you can hear me. Uh, the, the audio was put down because of Larsen effect, I would imagine. Sorry, but there was a cut in the internet connection, so apparently there is improvement still visible on the internet as such. So thank you for uh, having me today there uh, virtually. Unfortunately, I could not come. Uh, as uh, Giacomo, I work for the same organization, EBU which is 70 members in 56 countries with um, uh, almost 120 organizations. Uh, the introduction made by my colleague from BBC, by Bill Thompson, has been the perfect one for my uh, intervention now. I, will, uh, I, I am here the Director of Technology Innovation, so I will speak about some of the applications we have actually, uh, and we are actually developing to improve uh, the uh, internet access and to improve the media access uh, using the advantages of an organization like EBU, working together and building together tools that could help us developing uh, uh, new tools for the citizens. Uh, so using the AI for good, using the artificial intelligence where it does make sense, and uh, uh, I will speak uh, about three uh, projects and three products we are working on. One is what we call Eurovox. Uh, Eurovox is a, is a project and uh, is a set of open source tools that we are developing. So to allow any citizen to access any content into their uh, mother tongue. 
This is very important. This is based on AI technologies. This is important for many reasons. It's important because uh, any citizen can reach any information from any source, but it's also important mainly for the democratic advantage of this because you will be able, any citizen will be able to access content well from different sources and create his own idea of what is and where is the truth. So that's one uh, big advantage. And this is a project in which we have today eight of our bigger and some of the smaller members that are participating and more and more are joining into this project. So uh, this is something that we will uh, uh, publicly show into operations. We have already done some early demonstrations, but uh, during the IBC in Amsterdam in 2020. Uh, a second uh, tool that we are developing and we have been developing is already in operation with several of our members is a recommendation and personalization engine that solves the problem of the goldfish ball. So this is one element that has been underlined uh, at the beginning of this conference. And I think that this is very important because working with the values and with the principles of a public uh, broadcaster, we have developed a system that is called Pitch Personalization for Each that uses recommendation engine, GDPR modules, and all the tools to allow the information to reach uh, our uh, citizens, all the citizens in an open way and in such a way that is not creating this isolation, uh, uh, say, person by person and uh, having a distortion in, in the information. So. This is the other element. I would like to underline that these two developments are done on an open source basis and on an open platform basis. So the idea is that these tools can be used by any of our members and in, the, in due time by any other uh, entity that would like to join into our uh, developments. And third, uh, uh, what is important is also not only to have the tools to improve the quality, but is also important to have the uh, ability to reach people. I mean, one of the things that is important is how do we, uh, how do we reach 100% of the population in any country, on any territory. So 100% of the population, 100% of the territory. For this reason, we are very active in promoting uh, uh, the idea of 5G broadcasting. So this is 5G for media delivery in all territories, in all countries. And for this, we are in particular uh, uh, pushing for a solution which is sustainable to cover 100% of the countries. 5G should not be only limited to the very highly populated areas in Western countries. It should be able to reach any population in any country with a sustainable cost. And for doing this, we are promoting a solution which is a multi-layer solution where you can have the layer of cellular, the layer of broadcasting using the towers, the high towers that we already operate for direct to home uh, uh, transmission of uh, terrestrial television, and using also a satellite layer so that these three layers orchestrated together and used together can uh, optimize the delivery of content, reduce the cost of the infrastructure because you don't need to construct a structure that is very costly, covering very large uh, uh, areas in Unicast, and uh, having this infrastructure covering 100% of the population, combining the low physics where they work best. So this is done by EBU. This is done by EBU in collaboration with all the media industries, not only the public broadcasters, but also the private broadcasters, the regulators, the manufacturers, all the institutions on a worldwide basis. And we have created an organization called 5G Mag, which is defending the needs for the media industry in order to reach 100% of the population and 100% of the territory. So I am, of course, at your disposal to go into more details about this. I hope you have been able to listen to this. And apologies again for the cut in the internet, but I don't know the reason why next time we will connect using a more reliable connection. Thank you very much, uh, and have a good day. I will follow the converse, your conversation with a lot of interest. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio. And now I hand over the second part of the moderation to Elena. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Giacomo, again, for inviting me. As Giacomo said, I, uh, I work with the World Association of News Media, and our members are publishers 
all across the world. Uh, I, I'm going to give the, word, the floor right away to the next speaker, but I just wanted to, uh, to touch upon the fact that uh, our friend Mr. Cleason from the uh, Council of Europe said this phrase that really struck me. He said, there are people who uh, like to say that any form of regulation will stifle innovation. It is true. What I hear is that many people come to us the World Association news media saying that any kind of regulation in the internet could stifle freedom of expression, which is just not true. What is stifling freedom of expression right now is that uh, the, the independent voices, the, uh, the, the news media, and particularly the smallest local uh, publishers uh, struggle with sustainability. Uh, and the reason for this is very often because the internet so far has been dominated by this, by a handful of extremely obscure uh, companies who very often transform uh, their users in, uh, in the product behind the pretense of uh, free services. So uh, we're struggling with sheer survival and that is why I'm very grateful that uh, we have been involved in this conversation today. Uh, I will now stop and give the word to our next speaker who is to, to continue this really interesting conversation. And uh, I would ask uh, Stefan Muller, please, from uh, ZDF Culture to explain to us what ZDF Culture is and how uh, it represents a new form of public service. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks very much. Um, yes. Um Thank you for the invitation to this panel and to give the, giving me the opportunity to talk about ZF Kultur. Um, what is ZF Kultur? It's a digital space for culture and one of several endeavors of ZF German television to take the public service mission into the internet era. ZF Kultur was launched this year in February, so we are still at the beginning at the, of the process and uh, since these are fast times, we are already right in the middle of re-evaluating and discussing new directions. But let's see uh, where we are today. Um, and as you have seen in the trailer at the beginning of the session, maybe it gave you a little um, um, impression um, visually and, and um, audio, from audio what we, what we do so far um, in ZF in, in terms of culture. And there are three aspects I would like to re-emphasize um, now. And, um, the first is user-centered content, which is very important to, uh, for us. The second is debate or discourse. And third is accessibility. So we have seen in the trailer uh, that you can find a variety of TV shows, concerts, music festivals, operas, theater, and cultural documentaries on ZF Kultur already. These are the, 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 the TV shows that we put on the internet for the people to, to, to stream and to, to, to uh, partially um, even download. And, but what's new? We included new categories such as debate, gaming, and design, and travel on our website. Why did we do so? Because of needs and expectations of users that we have identified in a media re research study. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in the next step, we decided to produce new web video series representing a wider range of cultural aspects including gaming, travel and food, and design. The goal was to present aspects of culture that many people can relate to. For example, the discussion about what makes a design object spectacular or a spectacular failure. Second, we believe that debate and discourse are at the core of democratic life and must be nourished by the public service media. This is even more important in times of fake news and um, filter bubbles. So we wanted to give people a forum to express their voice and opinions. Um, this could be famous actresses and directors talking about the female perspective on the film business, or it could be activists, scientists, or just normal, ordinary citizens contributing to debates such as if hijabs should be prohibited in certain public areas. Our role as ZF Kultur here is to listen and to moderate the discussion, not to lecture. Accessibility. We all know that many people have no easy access to art for lack of education, um, lack of finances, or sheer lack of interest. 
So we asked ourselves, how can we break some of these barriers? How can we make art accessible to everybody and how can we make it interesting or even fun? So we toured all the German federal states to find cultural partners to create digital projects together. To this moment, we have established 48 cultural partnerships in Germany. We developed a digital museum and together with our partners, we have been curating digital exhibitions from Lukas Kranach in Weimar, which is a Renaissance painter, to the famous contemporary painter Gerhard Richter in Dresden. The user can stroll along through these uh, virtual ex exhibitions and get more detailed information through texts, videos, and sound files commenting on each object on display. Another example is for all the book lovers out there, we made an interactive literature tool called Your Book, Dein Buch. It is based on the idea of the Tinder dating app. The goal is to narrow down your search to your next favorite book. And to each book, there's a short video review of, by one of our TV experts. Finally, we apply all our journalistic efforts to social media. We try to feed our users with interesting information about cultural phenomena and give room for discussion. We started on Facebook in February and plan to go to YouTube and Instagram in 2020. Some of our most successful posts on Facebook deal with language. For example, showing Arabic and Turkish origins in our daily language. This is one of many small contributions we try to make on ZF Kultur to inform, educate, and connect people through culture. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that's a very interesting and inspiring experience of what you can do on the internet, not only making money out of it, but making uh, public value for citizens. Hmm? Thank you, Stefan. Um, now we would really like to hear from Paolo Lanteri from the World Intellectual Property Organization with uh, topics that are particularly dear to my heart <laughs> and my art industry. And uh, from you, Paolo, we would really like to understand, do you believe that internet one, that one day could remunerate artists and creators as today is done in traditional media? Or do you actually uh, believe that it exists, a public service internet that doesn't include the recognition of the author's rights? maybe based on Creative Commons or weak copyright? Uh, let's start with the first question. And um, do I believe that the internet can remunerate artists and creators one day? Well, the answer is yes, yes, it can. And yes, it should. Uh, perhaps it's taking a bit longer than what we could have all hoped. But there are already several examples of successful business models proving that the goal of matching high consumption with uh, fair remuneration is actually within reach. It's enough to look back 10, 15 years, and the situation for both the creators and the users was much more complicated. Um, legal offer was significantly lower, and creative content online was scattered and largely offered on illegal uh, websites or from illegal sources. For example, in 2011, online music services were available in 28 countries of the world, while today we are talking about a full coverage. Practically all world has some sort of legal offering of music. Similar trends can be observed for movies, audiovisual sector, and publishing. Um, of course, I'm not saying uh, uh, the situation is solved. There are still very important challenges that need to be addressed, such as finding appropriate solution for regulating internet service providers' responsibility, or making sure that the revenues are shared fairly among all the players in the chain. So there are no real magic answers, uh, but there are some particularly promising areas uh, where we see room for improvement. First, for sure, technology. Technology can provide solution, especially when we talk about granular and interoperable metadata and identifiers. Those can really support efficient management and higher level of transparency for all players of the chain. Secondly, it's not always easy, but cooperation, cooperation among business players for instance, internet platforms, media, creative sector, including first row creators, 
can, as it's proved in some instances, to provide easier solutions that would not always require a legal mean. Finally, of course, norm setting and regulation. Um, updating the rules of the game uh, and making sure there is a fair market and guaranteeing that the corporate system continues to uh, play its role, it's essential. On this point, it's clear that technology runs faster than the law. It's always been the case. However, IP norms that had a specific focus on the internet already exist at all levels. On the multilateral side, out of the eight WIPO administered treaties in the field of copyright, four have been adopted and negotiated only taking into account of the internet. Those are, for instance, the WIPO Internet Treaties of 96 or the Marrakesh Treaty. At the mm, regional level, I don't need to mention uh, the European Directive uh, uh, on Copyright in the Digital Single Market because I, I'm sure all of you must have heard from the media. And at the national level, a recent study from WIPO showed how 94 countries of the world modified their national system between 2006 and 2016 to update the law to the digital environment. And more reforms are coming. At the international level, we are currently negotiating a treaty for protection of broadcasters online, partially online, not only online, but also online. At the national level, I dare to say there is an unprecedented number of countries engaged in copyright law reforms as we speak today in all corners of the world. All these norm setting initiatives prove the economic and social importance of the matter at stake. So regulation will probably need to be updated on a quite regular basis, unfortunately. It is going to be a long and arduous road, but hopefully heading towards the right direction. Regarding the second question, whether I see a public service internet with weak copyright, well, I sincerely doubt it, uh, and uh, why do I doubt it? First of all, it's clear, we have to remind ourselves that without a well-functioning copyright system, you would still need to find incentives to support professionally created content. The professionally created content are the content that serve our education, serve news reporting, entertainment. Those are very complex businesses, endeavors requiring highly skilled labor force and major investments. Are there alternatives? Do we want to go to patronage? Do we want to go to public subsidies? That's an open question for you. But for now, IP is the legal tool that, that allow those sectors to thrive and exist. The second reason is possibly stronger. Models like Creative Commons, open source software, that mentioned in the question, are extremely successful and will continue to thrive in their respective areas. For instance, WIPO itself, we strongly believe in those, uh, in those alternative system as they are often referred to. WIPO itself, besides widely using open source software to providing its services, has also launched an open access policy that implies the use of Creative Commons for all content created by WIPO. So these models are often cons and wrongly considered as alternatives to copyright. But in fact, they exist and they function only because of copyright. They are based on the exercise of economic rights, are just alternative ways of licensing those rights. Notably, the viral effect that is the backbone of platforms like Wikipedia or all open source software developments, extremely successful one, would not be enforceable and it would not exist without copyright norms. So to sum up, if your question, if in your question you replace the word weak with balanced, my answer would have been different. But I don't think we should look at this, this question between uh, in looking at whether we need a weak or strong copyright. We should look at, uh, for we should find uh, a way to identify solutions that are practicable, effective, uh, and balanced that could actually support both creation of new content and access to existing one on a public service internet. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. 
Uh, we're now going to hear from um, Xin Hun from uh, UNESCO about the Internet Universality Indicators Project. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Elena. Thank you so much, uh, Giacomo, for having composed such a wonderful panel and always flagging the critical issues of media, public service concept in the IG discussion. And um, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, in the spirit of the public interest, may I just have a very minor suggestion. I hope our panel can be <coughs> having more uh, women speakers next time. And also, I hope to hear more uh, voice from women audiences next time because gender equality has been such an issue of public interest, uh, both for the media and also for the internet. So <clears throat> let me be short. I like to have some really Q&As. Um, internet universality has been there for years by UNESCO to promote four uh, dimensions of internet, which are all about the public interest of the internet. First of all, for United Nations, for UNESCO, the biggest public interest is sustainable development, is a human rights-based approach. Internet should be used to empower everybody, every country, all the sustainability development of the, in, of, of the people and the society. And for this uh, strategic purpose, we, we I mean, not we, I mean, it's really our 193 member states have endorsed four principles. Internet should be human rights based, should it be open, not, not to be fragmented, it should, should it be accessible by all, should it be driven by a multi-stakeholder approach. So that's the basic position. And now we have the 303 indicators developed to measure these four principles. To what extent this public interest dimensions have been achieved by the national state? So it's called the like X ring of the internet policy to diagnose the health, the the problems of the internet as an ecosystem, as the largest ecosystem of modern society. Yesterday we had an interesting event to showcase the first. Um, 20 countries initiative to assess this uh, internet indicator. Uh, what I heard is very interesting. On a rights dimension, I mean, Rome principle, rights uh, dimension, uh, in many countries, the free expression, uh, freedom information are beautifully guaranteed in the law and rights online, offline, but the implementation will be an issue. And the quality of enforcement at the national level, that will impact the public interest to a great deal. In terms of openness, the neutrality continue to be a challenge for many countries. In the law, it's not clear, it's not well defined, and not mentioned the implementation. And access, yes, physical access has been achieved uh, uh, to a great extent, 90% in many countries, even in Africa, that's 50%. Um, but if you look at the content, content is a king for media, for public media, but also for the internet, the, the multilingualism of the content, and also the access to the content by the people, marginalized group, women, girls, and people with disabilities are far from being well addressed. Lastly, multi-stakeholderism, all stakeholders, I mean, it's not just government who is the one to decide unilaterally. It's really a consultative process to decide on all those issues regarding everybody's interest. And uh, social inclusion, I mean, women and uh, different minorities uh, should all be on the board to discuss the policies. And also global level, um, just now I heard a lot of uh, progress, advancement uh, from our European colleagues. Really, congratulations. I'm so uh, happy to hear that public service broadcasting media are uh, being advancing in the digital area. But uh, outside Europe, we have, have, we have to see such a gap uh, in terms of the public service media and also in terms of the, this value is being embedded in the, in, on the internet. That's why I'm uh, really uh, looking forward that uh, there can be more international uh, cooperation, digital cooperation. And, um, and your uh, initiative um, on the public space also impressed me. I also hope that can go beyond Europe. Europe, we can have more members from the rest of the world because now internet is connecting us all, connecting all of us. Last point is really one sentence, artificial intelligence. We are also doing a, a launching of new research tomorrow morning at 9.30. One issue about artificial intelligence is, is hugely impact factoring into the media landscape. It's 
reinventing new business model. It's, it's changing the way of journalists uh, producing and reading and uh, writing the news. And also, it's um, a new gatekeeper to, to restrict and also define the user's access. So I think we can discuss everything more. But then I stop here. I'd like to hear more discussions. Thank you. Is there uh, any questions for our speakers? We're now at 11.22. Because the, the organizers, they said that we have to close as soon as possible to, in order to prepare the next session that will take place here. So if you have any supplementary question, we are outside now for the next minute, so probably we can eventually have a a personalized one-to-one -one service of broadcasting, no, not broadcasting, in that case, for all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the speakers for your contribution. Thank you also to the remote participants that are still with us. And uh, see you around in these days to the, continue to discuss about the public interest over the internet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.